everybody. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Bill Cavanaugh. I'm a professor here at DePaul and director of the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology. A very grand name for our small uh, center. Some people think the Center for World Catholicism is in Rome, but we know it's right here at DePaul. <laughs> So, um, the purpose of the center is to shine a spotlight on the church in the global south. So, Asia, Africa, Latin America, where um, a lot of the energy in the church is coming from uh, these days. Um, thank you for coming tonight. Please do um, give us your name if you'd like to be on our uh, mailing list and receive updates about uh, the events that we have. Um, uh, we usually have Mm, six, seven, eight, ten events uh, per year, including World Catholicism Week every April, which is a, a large event, and this year will be centered on uh, ecology and the church, and we have uh, people coming from all over the, all over the world for that event. Um, one other preliminary before I introduce our guest speaker is just to say that there's a student dance troupe that has reserved the room next door, and they have it until seven o'clock, so until seven o'clock, I'm afraid Father Raj, you're going to need to just speak, speak boldly, and we'll have a little bit of um, background music to go with your uh, talk. I'm sorry about that, but um, anybody feels inspired to dance, um, you're more than more than welcome. So I want to um, introduce our speaker tonight, the Reverend Raj Zacharias. Since 2012. Father Raj has served as secretary of the Catholic Bishops Conference of India's Office for Dalits and Backward Classes. Backward Classes is an official government uh, term used to classify castes that are educationally and socially disadvantaged. And part of uh, Father Raj's role is to uh, lobby and advocate uh, in support of obtaining scheduled caste status for the uh, Dalit uh, Christians. Uh, and to that end, he's organized several uh, national events, including uh, last year the One Million Postcard Campaign to India's Prime Minister and uh, several other protests. And he also coordinates the uh, Bishop's Commission's of 13 ecclesiastical regions and 167 Catholic dioceses in India. Um, he organizes training programs to empower women, youth, and leaders within the Dalit community. Father Raj holds bachelor's degree in theology and philosophy from the Sacred Heart Seminary in Chennai. Uh, he has a degree in law, an MA in sociology, and a diploma in development leadership from the Cody International Institute at St. Xavier University in Nova Scotia. And he's co-editor of the 2013 book, Building Inclusive Communities Through Dalit Empowerment, Papers and Statements on Dalit Christians. Uh, so without further ado, um, please uh, join me in welcoming Father Raj. Thank you, Bill, for your kind introduction. Good evening, sisters and brothers. Good evening. With uh, full joy and happiness, I call you sisters and brothers. I cannot call sisters and brothers the same meaning in India because the Indian society is not one homogeneous society, rather, it is stratified according to the caste system where one cannot call the other as brother or sister because the Dalits themselves are not even considered to be human beings. So how can the non-human beings call the other people brothers and sisters? So that is the situation. And I thank uh, the Paul University, Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology for giving me the opportunity to share the situation of the Christians, especially the Dalit Christians uh, in India. And my presentation will be of these three topics, issues faced by contemporary Christian, the commun uh, contemporary Christian community in India, social background, 
especially the caste system in India and issues faced by the Dalit Christians. So my presentation will be more of from the perspective of the Dalit Christians. Even if I talk about Christian community or Indian community, I will be talking from the perspective of the Dalit Christian community. Um, you see the people having brooms in their hands. That is the symbol for the election for the party called Aam Aadmi. Aam Aadmi means Common People's Party. In the last election in Delhi, out of 70 seats, they won 67 against the ruling federal government, Bharatiya Janata Party, short it is called BJP, uh, for which Mr. Narendra Modi is the Prime Minister. Against him, he was able to sweep 67 seats. And how this has become a very international issue, international talk, people, many people talked about this, and why he was able to win so many seats. You can see this uh, slide from the scene on IBM. Why he lost? Maybe because of Garwapsi, the church attacks. This, this, this is one of the reasons that they are giving. What is Garwapsi? You can see this picture, Gangaru. The idea behind is, all people living in India are Hindus. The ancestors of minorities, minorities there, Christians and uh, Muslims, they were Hindus, so they have to come back to their home. So, Gar, Vapsi, Gar means house, home, Vapsi means coming back. So, that is the meaning. The philosophy behind is this birds return to their nest without anybody's interference, animals walk back to their dwellings spontaneously. Then, why our own breath, people hesitate to return to their home religion, Hinduism? So this is the philosophy behind. Even if you are a Christian, even if you are a Muslim, your ancestors were Hindus. So naturally you have to come back to the mother religion called Hinduism. That is the philosophy behind and the reason behind why these people want to have this Garvapsi. This Garvapsi homecoming ceremony is conducted in different places where they compel the other Christians and Muslims to come back to the mother religion, it may be through cohesion or allurement. So, when people question about this Garvapsi, they say missionaries, they you make use of the money and allurement, cohesion to get the people to their religion, maybe to Christianity or to Muslim, Islam. So, there needs to be a, an anti-conversion bill. So, the, this has been going on in three states in Odisha, Madhya Pradesh, Arunachala Pradesh. They say, uh, people in one of the judgments, the observation in the Supreme Court, Apex Court in India, they say, Article 15 of Indian Constitution gives freedom of religion. That means, you can freely profess, practice and propagate any religion you want. That is the constitutional uh, right that is given by the Constitution. But, these people say this constitutional right is not to convert anybody. You can propagate, practice and preach, but you cannot convert anybody. The conversion depends upon the individuals. So, this has created a lot of problems. Some people say, even the people who converted themselves back to Hinduism, they say, even after conversion, we don't see any difference. So, what is the use of remaining in this religion? So, some people say that, even after conversion, we face the same kind of uh, social exclusion in the new community. So, we come back to Hinduism. That is the reason some people give. So, recently, there were attacks on Christians. Many attacks, especially in the past one year, when the recent government called the BJP, which is a communal uh, party like, uh, there are a lot of attacks on the Christians. In 1999 itself, one preacher, Dr. Graham Stuart Staines, he was killed, burnt alive with his two sons. That was in 1999. And in 2008, there was a, a big attack on the Christians in a district called Kandamal in the state called Odisha. So according to the report, 
official officially 90 Christians were killed. That means both Dalits, these, these people are both Dalits and tribals. And in the riots, over 50,000 people were displaced. They are still, some of them are still living in the camp, makeshift camp. And according to All India Christian Council report, more than 18,000 were injured, 50,000 displaced, 310 villages were affected, and 4,640 homes, 252 churches, and 13 educational institutions were torched. That is in 2008. And there was one sister, Walsa, who was working among the tribals, and she was hacked to death in 2011. This is the recent attacks in the past two months in Delhi itself. Delhi is the capital of India. In Delhi itself, under the nose of the Prime Minister, 55, sorry, five attacks took place. Uh, on the right, you see a big uh, church was completely burned inside. On the left, you see the tabernacle was broken open and the sacred posts were desecrated. And recently there are hate campaigns against the minorities. One honorable Sadhvi, the Union Minister for State and Food Processing, she says, you have to decide if you want your government peopled by the children of Ram, that is the Ram is the Hindu God, or you want one full of bastards. That means she used this word, even as a minister, she was able to use this word. So, the bastards, she means the minorities. And the RSS, RSS is the Rastriam Swayam Sad, Savak. That is the voluntary organization of the Hindus. He said, we need to ensure one language, one God and one religion. And for unity, we need uniformity. And he says, this is the positive time for this. Against this whole attacks and hate speeches, when uh, Mr. Obama came to India, on 27th he made a speech, he said, India will succeed so long it is not splintered on religious lines because he saw a lot of things happening you know, during his visit and he spoke out very openly during the town hall meeting and after coming back to the states also in Washington DC on 5th February he said this is the place where everybody lives together everybody lives together it is incredible but at the same time a place where in the past years religious faiths of all types have on occasion been targeted by other peoples of faith simply due to their heritage and their beliefs. So he re reiterated his uh, disappointment with regard to the situation in India. Now I go back to give some kind of basic information about India. So India has a population of 1.2 billion according to the official census taken by the government of India in 2011. So this is the picture of a map of India. And in India, 2.3% uh, are Christians. Both the Christians, I mean Protestants, Catholics, Orthodox, as well as independent churches. In Catholicism, we have three rites, Syro Malabar, Syro Malankara, and Latin rite. And among the Christians, 65, around 65 percent of the people are Dalit Christians. That means around 18 million. India is a home for the ancient Indian Indus Valley civilization, and it has given birth to the four major religions: Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, and Sikhism. And according to linguistic survey of India. Uh, People speak 780 languages, different languages. It is multi-linguistic, multi-religious, and multicultural, pluralistic, which makes India beautiful. And always we have the slogan called unity in diversity. We enjoy the diversity, we respect the religious and uh, language and other things. We respect each other. That was the uh, situation that was going on for the past 2000 years. 
Uh, this is the religious demography of the say according to the census 2011 Hindus are 78 percent Muslims 14 percent Christians 2.3 Sikhs 1.9 Buddhists 0.8 Jains 0.4 others 0.6 so the Christians form only 2.3 percent uh, I said this India is divided or stratified according to the caste system how the caste system originated in India is a question. There are different theories. Um, according to the theory given by Dr. Ambedkar, he said Aryans from Central Asia invaded and overcame the original inhabitants in India with their superior physical and intellectual power. They divided the original inhabitants into various Varna. Varna means color or caste and keeping themselves at the top. So according to them, people originated from different parts of Brahma, the god of creation. Some people came from the head, they are called a priestly class. Some people came from the mouth of Brahma, they are warrior class. Some people came from the hands of Brahma, they are traders. And some people came from feet, they are service class. And some people did not come from any part of Brahma, so they are called outcast. You can see on the left, uh, on the left, the pyramid, where you see the Brahmins at the top, that is priestly class, the Kshatriya, the warrior class, the Vaishyas, the Sudras, and the untouchables are not part of the caste system. They are outcast, and they, the caste system is called the Varna system, the Chadur Varna. Chadur means four, four Varna. Since they don't belong to any of these, they are also called Panjamas. Panch means five, the fifth caste. You can also see this picture uh, on the right, you see the God of creation. And from different parts of Brahma, the God of creation, people come. And it is, the people are put one over the other. So the top is the Brahmins. So you can see the ladder, the pyramid. That is the social system that is organized. So, this is justified by the code. They have their own code called Manuspridi. Manuspridi is, Manuspridi is the Hindu code which guides the life and principles, the moral values of the Hindus. It says Chandalas, that is outcast, should be outside the village. They should be deprived of dishes. Their property should be consist of dogs and asses. Their clothes should be garment of the dead and their arm, ornaments made of iron. Food given to them in broken dishes and they must always wander about. That means they don't have their own place. So according to the Manusmriti, the code of the Hindus, there are some restrictions given to the Dalis. They cannot possess any property you cannot possess except the dogs, dogs and donkeys and these people are not eligible to learn they are denied of education and they cannot possess weapons to protect themselves and this caste system originated 2000 years back how it is able to maintain its structure even now even after 2000 years they are not able to break down the caste system because they believe in the cycle of birth. If you are in this world, in this life, you are in a pathetic condition because it, the things you did in the past, you did not follow the caste principles in the past life, so you are born in this life. To be born in a better life, do your caste duties now very well. Then you will be born in a better life. And they believe in the predestination. You are in this life because you have been predestined to be like this. Karma means deeds. Whatever you do in this life affects the next life. So do your duties according to the caste principles. Endogamy is the marrying one side in, only inside the caste system. If you marry outside, you will become outcast. You will be killed, even killed by your own parents. If you marry outside, that is called honor killing. The honor killing is going on even now. 
and they also believe in the concept of purity and pollution. The people who are outcast are polluted, so you cannot touch them. Their touch also pollute, pollute you. So these are of the concepts which people believe and that has been continued and that's why it is, the caste system is practiced even now. Who are these Dalits? Dalits, according to the Sanskrit word and Hebrew, Hebrew word, it means broken, downtrodden, oppressed, shattered, scattered. In a positive sense, it means split and emerge for self-assertion. This was first used by a Magarashtrian social reformer, Magatma Jodhirao Kule, and also by Dr. Ambedkar. He is a champion of Dalits. Dr. Jodhirao Kule was born in a backward caste, that is Sudra community, the fourth caste, and he worked for the emancipation of all these people. Other names are, you can see the outcasts, already explained, Harijans, Harijans means children of God, this name was given by Gandhi. Avarnas, Varna means caste, Avarna means opposite to caste, casteless people. Panchamas, the fifth class. Chandalas means worse on the earth. Depressed class was given by the British during the colonial period and now they are called scheduled caste because there are different groups who belong to the uh, Dalit community. They all been put together and they are called scheduled. They are all scheduled and one, one, one scheduled, so they are called scheduled caste. According to the National Human Rights Commission report on the Prevention of Atrocities Act against Schedule caste, every 18 minutes a crime is committed against Dalit. Every day, three Dalit women are raped, two Dalits are murdered, two Dalit houses are burned in India, 11 Dalits are beaten. Every week, 13 Dalits are murdered, 5 Dalits' home and possessions are burned, 6 Dalits are kidnapped or abducted. That means every day they are undergoing atrocities. This is one of the pictures that is taken in one of the Dalit villages. This is a situation where how the Dalits live. And this is the socio-economic condition of the Dalits. Most of them, at least 30% of the Dalits live below poverty line. And half of 54% uh, of their children are undernourished. 83 by 1000 give birth in, a, in their homes. They don't go to the hospital. So there are many, many things. Um, this is the situation of uh, Dalit children. They are, they are child laborers. They don't have access to schools. So they do this kind of work, whereas other children go to the school. And in some schools, most of the schools, the Dalits have to sit separately. In some of the houses, the males are not delivered. They cannot have uh, access to water, the common water sources. Half of the India's Dalit children are undernourished, and the literacy rate is very low, 37.8. This is the picture, uh, many people use it. This is the situation of untouchability. A caste woman is pouring water in the hands of the Dalit because this touch of the vessel will pollute the vessel as well as the house and the people living in, live inside. So this is the way how they give water. Even if they want to give some leftover food, they give it in the back door of the house. So, in the present, even today, the untouchability is practiced in different ways and subtle forms. And they, most of the houses are outside the village. So, they have separate settlements. They have two tumbler system in the village tea shops. And they are not allowed to entry. They are not allowed to enter into the temple. And they are forbidden to wear footwear when they walk in the streets of the caste people. Marriage outside, that is, endogamy is very strict. In the past years, there, are, there have been many protests against this caste system. In 6th century BC itself, because the caste system originated 500 years before, 5, 500 years before, uh, 5,000 years before 
uh, Christianity. So uh, the people, some people revolted. This Sharvaka is a materialist philosopher. He started a movement called Lokayat. Lokayat. He said there should not be exploitation on the basis of caste. This Buddhism and Jainism, it is a protest religion, religious against this caste system. Uh, mostly Jainism is followed by the trading class. But Buddha, he was a revolutionary. He preached equality for the people and he admitted all people into his religion. And 8th to 18th century Bhakti movement started, that is devotion movement in which many philosophers, poets and writers came from the Dalit community. And these are the individuals who wanted to make it big reforms. I mentioned you earlier this Jodhirao Phule, uh, Dr. Peria Ramasamy is from Tamil Nadu, he was a rationalist. And Dr. Ambedkar is from Maharashtra state from the north. And one Narayana Guru from Kerala. These are very, uh, some of the revolutionaries who spoke against this caste system. And because of this, some movements and political parties emerged. Uh, Dalit Panther movement was uh, as that of Black Panthers, they started following the principles of Dr. Ambedkar. And major party in the national level is Bhagjan Samas party, that is People's Party by on Mayavadi. There are in a state parties which are working for the emancipation of these Dalits. So, what is the role of Christianity in this situation? So, it, it also was a threat to the caste system in a, such a, in, in a way. The Christianity entered uh, through St. Thomas the Apostle in the first century itself. But it remained uh, only in Kerala. It did not spread to other uh, parts of India until 16th century. <coughs> 15th century, the Portuguese came to India. They got permission from the Portuguese king. At the same time, they, have, they had a, a mandate from Pope. It is called Padraudo, which allows them to preach and to control the mission in India. When these people preached Christianity, they preached mostly to the higher caste people because they believed in the trickle-down theory. That is. When the caste people are converted, automatically the other people will be converted. So, they encourage the caste people conversion to Christianity. And Robert de Nobili is one of the uh, missionaries. He invented a technique, missionary uh, technique called, uh, they divided the missionaries into two divisions. One is serving for the upper caste, the other group serving for the lower caste. So in that way they divided, so that they also built different churches for Dalits and caste people, and that's how this caste system slowly grew, grew inside the Catholicism itself. And why people converted to Christianity? It's not just because they were taken up by the missionaries, but because they wanted to come away from the caste system. In the words of Lancelio Otto, we see, to get liberation from the oppression by Hindus with the help of the Portuguese, they got baptized in Christian religion. People became Christians to get food, good food, to wear decent dress, to move freely, to get rid of the clutches of oppressive Hindus, to save themselves from the clutches of Hindus, to get married to Catholic girls. So, to get dignity and honor, the Dalits came into Christianity. And uh, since there was untouchability practice within the church, some people wrote, how can we go about with the conversion? Because there are different caste people in India. How can we go about? There was a bull from uh, the Pope, which said, it agreed to tolerate certain traditions, customs of Brahmins. However, the bull put some condition that whichever is degrading the dignity, uh, a superstition should be avoided. That was the bull given by the Pope. But the bull also agreed that the status quo of the caste system can be maintained. And in 1779, Congregation for the Propagation of Faith, they wrote to India, separation within the church and at the entrance of the church also the distinction of cemeteries may actually be tolerated for fear of greater evil. 
it was written in 1779 even now we have two cemeteries and some places the Dalit Christians are not allowed to have access to uh, the altar they are not allowed to even read the Bible on the altar even the boys and girls are not allowed to serve the uh, as altar, altar uh, students are so even in Christianity there was protest against this caste system practice within the Christianity. Uh, in 1831, in Puducherry, earlier it was called Pondicherry, there was a revolution in 1839 because the people were se seated separate in the church. There was a wall between the Dalits and non Dalits. Though so, the Dalits could not agree to that, they protested. Since most, most of these Dalits were cooks under for the bishops and priests they made a strike they stopped cooking for the bishop and priest so they they had to give up and they broke the wall that was called the revolution uh, in 1831 in 1925 dalit christians wrote to uh, bishop alexius mantria henry who was the vicar apostolic of india they wrote uh, they are seated separate in the churches <coughs> Holy Communion is distributed only at the end uh, once, uh, once all the other people receive. Their children are not admitted in the boarding schools, convents and seminaries. This was the report complaint they wrote in 1925. These Dalit Christians now are multiply discriminated. Uh, untouchability in the church as well as leadership is denied to them. They are discriminated by the community as general, by the society as well as they are denied of affirmative action by the government. Uh, so in 1990, uh, this father Antin Raj made a research in which he says there are a lot of uh, discriminatory practices that are going on in the Catholic Church. He made a survey in Tamil Nadu and he says these are many things are going on. And I have mentioned so many things which I have mentioned earlier, separate cemeteries, separate peer scores, the students are not admitted, though so many things he has, uh, he has mentioned. Uh, this, I quote one, one example uh, in a place called Yerayu. They people wanted to have uh, one here car. They want to have access through the main road. They wanted to have one cemetery because they have two cemeteries. And they wanted to have the Marian procession come to the Dalit village, to the Dalit streets. But a big um, attack took place by the caste Christians on the Dalit village uh, on March 9, 2008 in which two people were shot dead uh, by the police but that happened to be the caste people because they made so much arson they wanted to stop it even though uh, they are Dalit, they are not uh, Dalits, they are Christians we regret their lives is lost because of the caste war they said the blood of the blood of caste is thicker than the water of baptism. This is a, a another village. Uh, this is, this source has been taken from the front line. This is the caste uh, cemetery in which a Dalit was buried for the first time because the Dalit uh, who died happened to be a brother of a Catholic Dalit priest. So he wanted to bury him in that. The man who dug the cemetery was found dead on the following day because he might have been killed by the caste people. So even they, whenever there is a protest, they are also always affected, they are even killed. This is another uh, scene uh, existing even now in a place called Trichy. This is a separation wall between the caste cemetery and the Dalit cemetery. Uh, uh, this is not uh, place that is taking place only one part of India, it is taking place in many places. Uh, I have mentioned some of things, Karnataka, that is that is also in the south part of India. Uh, they say they, the last line, they too experience different discriminations against them. Uh, this is in Goa, uh, the two uh, categories of people, Goakar and the Dalis, they, they, they wear blue ribbon and red ribbon to identify themselves as Dalis and non-Dalis. In Kerala, uh, in a report given by Bishop Aradhi Sami, he says, in certain dioceses in Central and South Kerala, there are pockets of Pulayas, Pulayas Dalis, 
Players means Dalits, who because of their low caste origins are considered inferior. The church hierarchy ignores them, their very existence. In Andhra Pradesh, the, some of the pastors are given food in the veranda. Sometimes they had to clean their own uh, plates and other things when the people are not there. Usually the uh, people eat in, on the banana leaves, banana leaves, they had to carry and clean the, by themselves. In Punjab, Rajasthan, Odisha and Maharashtra, this north part of India, the, uh, mostly it is Baptist mission, the north is also Baptist mission and the leadership role is denied to them in the Catholic Church as well as in other churches. Uh, a memorandum was given to the, the present Pope, Pope Francis uh, by some of the Christian Catholic community. They give this uh, figure. You can see that there are 65% uh, Catholics among the Dalits among the Catholics. You can see on the first, there is, there is no Cardinal, no Archbishop. And there are among the 180, uh, 175 bishops, there are only 9 bishops. Major superiors, there are only 12. Catholic priests, among the 25,000, only 1,100. And religious sisters, only 4,500. So this can show how these Dalit Christians are not given the right place. This is a 3 minute uh, video. demonstration that took place uh, uh, on 11th December uh, in which the bishops, nuns and priests were arrested uh, because we were demanding affirmative action from the government. Because the government says, uh, according to the Constitution Schedule Card Order 1950, says only Hindus, Sikhs and Buddhists can be in the scheduled caste. Scheduled caste means the people, all the Dalits who are put in under one schedule and these people get the affirmative action from the government. So because of this, scholarship and education in education and professional education is denied to the Dalit Christians. They cannot get a reservation. And uh, in the economic development plan, these Dalits are not given space. Dalit Christians are not given space. And they are not protected legally. Because the other Hindu Dalits are protected legally from the onslaught of the caste people. Whereas once you become a Christian, you don't have legal protection. And these Dalits are given reserved constituencies to contest in the election from the village level, from the town level, up to the parliament, up to the Congress level. This reservation is denied to the Dalit Christians. Uh, that, that is why the protest was made. Uh, we said we have filed a uh, case in the Apex Court uh, challenging this particular order because according to the article 25 uh, everybody has the right to profess any religion he wants he or she wants this particular order denies this right to procession right to profession and religious freedom is denied and this article was also quoted by uh, mr obama in his speech and this is the commission uh, made by the government uh, this is called National Commission for Religious Linguist Minorities. It, after much studies, it says the affirmative action should be extended also, also to Dalit Christians. This is another study made by Tesh Pandey, uh, a, a Delhi University man. He also said, even after conversion, the economic, educational, social condition has not changed to the Dalit Christians, so they should be given affirmative action. Uh, what is the response of the church? I talk mostly about the Catholic Church. Uh, Blessed Holiness John Paul II said, Therefore, customs and traditions that perpetuate or reinforce caste division should be sensitively reformed so that they may all become the expression of solidarity with the Christians. Uh, CBC, the Catholic Bishops Conference of India, it says, Caste is a sin against God and humanity. And on February 3rd, 2015, uh, recently, our Apostolic Nuncio said, 
the church in India has to reaffirm a solidarity with the Dalits. Uh, the Christianity in India had a lot of impact on the, uh, on the society, the Indian society itself. They, it has an impact in the field of education, healthcare and community development because of the institutions of, uh, the, run by the Christians, many got education. The Dalits, they got primary education because of the missionaries. Healthcare is given to them. And now many people talk about their rights because of the community development that was done by the church. My conclusion is, the attacks on minorities is not just intimidating and threatening, but to impose Hindu hegemony which is based on hierarchical caste system, male chauvinism, and uniformity of religion. They want one Hinduism, one culture that is Hindu culture, one language, Sanskrit or Hindu. So this is a threat. The threat is not exactly against the minorities. The threat is against the egalitarian religion that is preached by Christianity. So it is, we have to see not as an attack on minorities, it is attack on democracy. Christianity in India to a certain extent stands egalitarian, as egalitarianism. Will it withstand or yield to Hindutva which says, if you want to be in India, be a Hindu Christian or a Hindu Muslim. So they say because Hinduism is a way of life, it is a culture, so you follow the Indian culture, which is Hindu culture, so be a Hindu Christian or a Hindu Muslim. Another question is, how far the significant number of Christian institutions, healthcare and the social service institutions are able to instill this egalitarian value in the larger society. Our Christian institution is a uh, very big institution, they have a lot of institutions in India. How far they were able to instill the value system of egalitarianism, the democracy into the hearts of the people and if it is so, why the percentage of Christians is still 2.3 and why these people want to attack the minorities? These are some of the questions uh, that I would like to raise. It is also for the introspection for our own church in India. And I thank you very much for the opportunity I have given to me. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for questions for Father Raj, so um, this is being recorded. I'm standing in front of the camera right now. Um, so uh, if you'd like to ask a question, we'd ask you to please uh, approach the microphone, that way everybody can hear and the, it can be uh, taken in by the recording as well. Uh, thank you very much, Father Raj, for a very, uh, very enlightening presentation. Uh, my question is, is there a difference between Indianness and uh, he, you know, what you describe as uh, Hinduism or yeah, yeah. Hindu culture? Yeah, yeah. Um, the Indianness uh, is something artificial, according to me. Uh, though India is politically one unit, it doesn't have one culture. Uh, it is only political unity that has put together many cultures together. Uh, we have different nations inside the country because the nation means speaking one language following one culture but in India we have different culture, multi-cultural, uh, multilinguistic so the Indianness comes only with regard to the patriotism uh, so that's the difference I want to make uh, well, so you can was, was this a creation of colonialism? You are right uh, the, uh, Hinduism gets its name from the river called Indus. The people who live, live below the Indus uh, river, they were all put together by the colonial period, during the colonial period. Before that, it was ruled by different countries, uh, different people, uh, by different kings. Uh, only during the colonial period, more or less, became one nation. And during independence, people wanted to be in one nation. And that becomes a uh, nationalist patriotic movement. And even during that time, uh, the Pakistan was divided before the independence. So uh, this is a political unity we have. And that, that we are proud, in spite of all these uh, different cultures, different languages, we are together as one country, India. 
but the social division is dividing the people much though there are other divisions like political and uh, like linguistic divisions so uh, it is the political unity that if you have I'd like to ask you, what is the role of religious congregations in order to abolish this discrimination? You mentioned there are only 5% of religious out of 65 planets. So yeah. there is a definite imbalance. Yeah. But those who are in religious congregations, I just wonder, right. because of the prophetic role of the religious world, is there anything that the kids, the religious are working, postman is working? Thank you for the question. In India, we have something called Catholic Religious of India, CRI. Most of the uh, Catholic uh, education institutions, healthcare institutions, social service institutions are run by these uh, religious people. They have intruded into the place where others cannot enter in jungles, in remote villages, they are doing wonderful service. Uh, in that way, uh, the tribals are educated, the Dalits are educated because of the religious people. But at the same time, when it comes to the vocation, it has not done well. So, more uh, Dalits, tribals have not been recruited. And we see, according to the survey that made, very few have become superiors of the congregations uh, from the Dalit community. So these are some of the things. Um, uh, the Catholic religious of India should uh, think about it, how they can empower the Dalits. It's not just giving. Now the Dalits are uh, becoming more and more aware of their rights and privileges and they don't want just uh, privileges, but they want their rights in the church itself, also the leadership right they are claiming for. You say something about Dalit Christian, but are there any Dalits among Hindus? And if, if there is a Dalit among Hindus, they have the same characteristics with the Dalit Christian? Yes. Um, all the, the, according to the caste system I mentioned, the four castes uh, belong to different caste groups. The fifth caste, uh, called Dalit, they are outcasts because they are not part of the caste. All these people are Dalits. 16.6% are these Dalits who are Hindus, Buddhists and Sikhs. So 16, a magic chunk uh, belong to this one. The, among uh, this, in this 16.6, the Dalit Christians are not included. So these people, as I mentioned, they are socially excluded from the other community and the different atrocities and different problems that are faced by Dalits are common to the Hindus, Christians, Buddhists and Sikh Dalits. There is no difference when it comes to Dalits, you are saying. And in this caste system, the women are considered always to be the second class. So the women, they don't consider women also. Uh, as equal to the, the caste people, they are always considered to be the second class. According to Hindu code of law, Manusmriti, the women are the possessions of the men. As I possess a watch, possess a house, women are possessed by men. The men possess women as a property. Father Raj, I wonder if you could say something about um, the theology of um, Christians in India when they deal with these questions, both uh, on both sides of the issue. So how do Christians in India who discriminate against Dalits, how do they justify that uh, theologically? And then if you could say something about Dalit theology, um, what sort of theology, what image of Christ, for example, is there a a Dalit Christ, a kind of Jesus Christ as a Dalit, as an outcast um, that, they, that they appeal to. Yeah. When the liberation theology emerged, at the same time in India the theologians also thought about Dalit theology, uh, a theology of liberation. They tried to th think about that. 
But while they were emerging, the Dalit theology, it was also equally suppressed. Uh, in the Protestant, it was mainly started by the Protestant side. Protestant uh, theologians, they started this uh, uh, Dalit theology. One or two Catholics also joined the Dalit theology. And uh, Professor, there was a Professor James Massey, they were the pioneers in ex uh, exploring this uh, Dalit theology. It's based on the liberation theology. Mm -hmm. Uh, in this Dalit theology, they present Jesus as a liberator. They start from the Exodus event, how these people from Egypt, Egypt were liberated. And they also connected with uh, Mary and in the New Testament, how these people are poor. Uh, these people, the disciples, the people, uh, Jesus who served, are uh, Dalit in the context of the Christ, uh, Jesus' time. So in that way, they have some kind of connection and they developed a Dalit theology, but uh, now in the Catholic uh, seminaries, the Dalit theology is not taught. Whereas in Protestant, all the seminaries, the Dalit theology is taught. Uh, I don't think in any of the Catholic the the uh, theology it is taught, except in one or two Jesuit uh, uh, theology, it is taught. It is taught as a Dalit studies, not as Dalit theology. Uh, so it is not uh, really accepted by the Catholic Church, whereas in the Protestant Church, it is recognized and accepted and taught. Um, uh, uh, I, uh, whether this has impact on Christianity is a question mark. Uh, even if it is taught in the theological colleges, this theology is not given to the people. And this theology is not taught to the people during the homilies and other things. Uh, so the Christianity that is taught is not from the bottom. Uh, as Dalit theology teaches, it is from the top level that preaching and everything goes on. We talk about uh, Christianity, uh, Bible and other things, but it's not talked from the bottom uh, up level. Yes, Francis. Father Raj, uh, can, uh, is there a way like uh, to move up to another caste, from the Dalit caste to another caste? Another thing is that I would say also that I would assume that there are also rich Dalits. Is there like a discrimination between the rich uh, Dalits and the uh, poor Dalits? And then also, how are they recognized as Dalits? Like when you're walking in India, how are they recognized as Dalits? Aside maybe from being a poor Dalit. Yeah. And then also, maybe there are also Dalits who are in diaspora, like maybe here in the US because there are many Indians here. Is there like a discrimination between the American Indians, but the and then against the non-Dalits. Yeah. If I don't forget to answer any of your questions, kindly. <laughs> <laughs> Four questions. Four questions you asked. Uh, the first question is whether we can change the caste. We, we, we cannot change the caste. Once you are born in a particular caste, you have to die in the caste. Uh, that's why I talked about the cycle of birth. You can be born in the next birth as in a better caste, only the next uh, birth, not in the present. People believe in the seven cycles, seven births in a cycle. So you cannot change the caste. You can change uh, your religion, you can change your economic condition, you can change your educational condition, but you cannot change the caste until you die. So that is one thing. Uh, second thing is um, whether... Are, are there rich Dalits? Yeah. Discrimination against like, the poor Dalits? Uh, so there are some people who have gone up in the caste ladder, uh, not in the caste ladder, economically they have might have gone up. Um, they, they have better education, better economic position. Some people have gone up. Now they call creamy layer. They call them creamy layer. That is, they are above the other Dalits. But when it comes to social discrimination, exclusion, it remains same. Whoever you are, you are the Dalit. So much so, there was a central minister uh, in India, uh, Chakjeevan Ram, he went and inaugurated a statue in a place called Varanasi, Banaras, and once he left, they washed the statue to clean the pollution that he has made. He is a very rich man, rich Dali, he is, he is the topmost uh, position in the political level, he is a mini uh, cabinet minister, but when it comes to untouchability, there is no difference. They had to wash where he touched. So they, they had to wash the pollution which he made. And uh, the, there are people who are here also diaspora in different places. 
uh, especially in uh, America and other places. Uh, if you know that uh, there is a law passed in UK against the discrimination against the Dalits. Wherever you are, wherever you move, you are Dalit there. Even if you are in America, you are a Dalit. Until you die, you are a Dalit. And we can see in the advertisements, if you go to the matrimonial advertisement, you can see that. I, Brahmin, so much Raj, wants a bride of my caste. It, this is advertised from America, from UK, from Canada. So the, there, is, uh, there is no change. The fourth question. How do you recognize it? Ah, yes, yes that's, a, that's a good question. Um, usually, as I said, uh, the settlement is different in each village. 80% of the people live in the villages, and all the villages are designed that the people live outside the village. Suppose I am from a village, if I go and meet, I, I, they will ask, so are you related to Father Ben? They will ask. Okay, uh, they know Father Ben is a Dalit. Then if I say I am related, then they will conclude that I am a Dalit. Suppose uh, if they are not able to say, they will ask, from which village? Okay, this village. From which street? So this particular street is only Dalit street. So they will uh, conclude. If they are in the cities and towns, it is little difficult. But from the roots, they will find out, are you related to this man, this, this woman? They will go on asking questions. At the end, they will conclude that you are a Dalit or a non-Dalit. So this is very easy in India to find out. In the north part of India, from the names you can understand, from the names you can understand whether you are a Dalit or a non-Dalit. Agarwal, Pate, these are all caste. Uh, Masi is a Dalit uh, group. So they, by, by the surname you can identify. Whereas in Andhra Pradesh and uh, Tamil Nadu, it is little difficult to identify from the surname. Sam, uh, your next Sam. So I have basically two questions. One is uh, why is caste system is not changing in India and staying in staying safe for about like one thousand years as suggested. And secondly, is that like in the pamphlet, there were a lot of like NGOs um, involved in um, doubted inequality issues, and they were, and you said they were working on it. But then, can you tell me uh, which uh, NGOs and which uh, religious orders or any type of um, organizations are involved in uh, equality movement and? Can you tell me uh, what specific uh, activity, activities do they do for the Italian equality movement, please? Yeah. Uh, as I said, uh, this caste system is hierarchical, one over the other. So the man or woman on the top is always happy about the person who are down below them. So there is always somebody below. So you are happy. You don't bother about the person who is above you. Rather, you are, worried, uh, you are happy about the person who is below you. So when it comes the Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaisyas, Sudras, and the last one, they, these people are voiceless people. They cannot even resist because of the pressure from the top. Uh, this is one of the reasons, because they also believe in predestination. I am in, I, I have to undergo, yes, it is my fate. It is my predestination that I have to be like this. So that is one thing. I also talked about uh, the, the cycle of birth, the karma, which says, okay, I am born because of my previous deeds, what I did wrong. Uh, so these are some of the reasons why this custom is uh, perpetuated. And mostly it is because of endogamy. Endogamy is very strict in India. Uh, as he said, if you marry outside the caste system, there is a village panjayat, the town panjayat, which keeps you outside the caste or kills you. Uh, they kill, literally they kill. And there is, I call, talked about the honor killing. If my daughter marries a Dalit man, it is a dishonor for my family, so I kill my own daughter. This is happening even now. So these are the, some of the reasons which is making the caste system rigid even now. Now I talked about the protest against this caste system from the beginning, from the 6th century BC. There were many movements, parties that were going on. And recent years, in the after 90s, when they celebrated the centenary celebration of the birth of Dr. Ambedkar, 
uh, who is the father of Dalits. He is the champion of Dalits. After this celebration, many movements emerged. Uh, I talked about the Dalit Panther movement. It is uh, more or less they wanted to do like uh, Black Panther here, where they want to assert themselves Dalit is something to be proud of uh, because they had been made untouchables. They are not Dalits as such. So uh, they have basically they have the dignity, they have a history, they have a culture which has been uh, which have been deprived from them. So uh, these movements have emerged. And now there are many uh, national and uh, local NGOs, non-government organizations which are working for that and they give that. The religious organizations like uh, Christianity, they always uh, promote uh, equality among the people. So it is because of Christianity that the Dalits who became Christians, they get the dignity. They feel proud. Even if you go and ask in a village which caste you belong, they don't know about caste. They will say, I am a Christian. They don't know the difference between the caste and the religion because the Christianity gave, the, gave them dignity. And there are some NGOs like you know, working in Small Father Ben has a Dalit Solidarity NGO uh, which is empowering the edu through the education. And there are some right based NGOs which are uh, working for the rights of the Dalits where they assert their rights. They have There are national NGOs as well as regional and local NGOs working for that. This only makes the people and these people, Dalit NGOs are also working along with other parties who are rationalists. The caste people, though some of the caste people, though they belong to caste, they, uh, they, they denounce the caste and say, I want to work for the equality of the people of, uh, around us. So there are people, many people of goodwill from all the communities who are working for this caste. Samson. First of all, thank you Raj for uh, uh, the uh, focus on the Christian uh, community in India. Uh, you pretty much answered uh, uh, my question, uh, but I, I was wondering, uh, actually I've been watching news and following the, uh, uh, you know, some of the NDTV news uh, in India, what's going on. Uh, like the attacks on churches, and uh, uh, is there a uh, like a protest going on uh, to support uh, the Christianity and uh, the attacks in this uh, uh, in India? And uh, if there is something going on, uh, how uh, are you guys doing anything, or is there anything that we can uh, possibly involve uh, and support uh, uh, the protest? Uh, either locally or internationally, there is something going on. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Um, as soon, uh, whenever the protest, uh, whenever the uh, church is attacked, always there is a protest. When the church, first church was uh, burned, uh, uh, the church was burned in a place called Dishkart Garden in Delhi, uh, within two days, people gathered in the city. They gathered in front of the police office, the big police office, they blocked the road for two hours uh, and the people promised, the officials promised, okay, we will do something, we will find out the culprits and we will rebuild the church, renovate the church uh, before Christmas, but nothing took place. Afterwards, another four attacks took place. When the last attack uh, took place, then the people really got angry on 5th, before I start here, I also participated in the protest just in front of uh, the cathedral in, the, in Delhi where not only the Christians, also the civil society who are uh, against this fundamentalism came together and they protested and we were arrested. Um, they also said, okay, uh, we will do something. Uh, so this protest is going on different parts and also when the bishops had their meeting in Bangalore, they went with the candle procession, 165 Latin bishops, they had their own conference. They went on the street uh, against this protest and different places of India protests were going on. Now, when it comes to the international level, it is because of the lobbying done by the Christians in, through the Congress, the uh, President was able to say something, that uh, the polarization that is taking place on the base of religion. So Obama sp spoke because of the lobbying that took place. So you can help in this level of lobbying in, through different sources you know, that is one thing. Other thing is, 
when the protest was going on uh, in, in all over India, there was also a protest in London where the Christian community came together and showed their uh, opposition of this unity on the base of religion, uh, on the base of communalism. So they were opposing the communalism that is taking place. So different places that, uh, that are going on, uh, you can do either a kind of thing or lobbying would be better because that speaks a lot uh, in the Indian situation. The international community can show their displeasure with regard to the attacks on minorities. Um, the most kind of shocking thing for me is that within the the Christians in India, that there's also um, there's also that separation of the Dalits. And if the origins now, this is my assumption that the origins of the caste system is Hindu in origin, uh, so religion based versus culturally based. Although there's a lot of intertwining, so how can then if someone that's a Christian still believe in the caste system within, um, you know, within their Christianity and um, treat the dollars in the Thank you. Uh, caste system as the origin from Hinduism. Hinduism cannot be considered without caste system. That's why somebody asked the question. I asked. I talked about. Uh, homecoming, Garvapsi, coming back to Hinduism. Somebody asked the question, okay, if I come back to Hinduism, to which caste I belong to? Because when you are in Hinduism, you have to be accepted in a particular caste or outcast. So when I come, I am, I, I feel that I don't have a caste, but when I come back, what caste I belong to? That is also, uh, it is confined, not only confined to Hinduism, though it has got origin from Hinduism, it, it is a social factor now. Though the origin is religion, it is a social factor that everywhere there is a caste system. It is not only with the Christianity, also in Islam. Islam also has a caste system where the people who converted are called with the different names in, in Islam. So when it comes to Christianity, we say by ideology, we don't accept caste system because Paul says, once you are a Christian, you are no more a Jew, or a Gentile, or a woman, or a man. Uh, you are baptized in Christ, you are one in Christ. But when it comes to practical level in India, though the missionaries preached uh, um, a religion which embraces everybody, when the people came in, they also brought their own caste names, caste system within the uh, church. So, as I said, the missionaries tolerated it tolerated the caste system. Uh, it was also endorsed by Rome with the bull. Uh, okay, you can tolerate the, uh, the practices. But one thing is, don't humiliate. Whatever uh, is against the dignity of man, don't practice. So they thought uh, only smashing of the ash and uh, having the thread, these are the caste symbols. Uh, but here, that they did not uh, restrict themselves with these caste symbols. They imbibed the caste system and they came with the caste system so much so they built different churches and they have different cemeteries and they have trouserless ch churches where one side caste people sit, other side Dalit sit. So this has been perpetuated for years. Now, uh, now the Christianity comes out vehemently saying we don't accept this caste system and they said it's a sin, sin against God and humanity. So that much they have God said but the people is very difficult to understand. It's very difficult for the people to renounce caste system. I think we have time for one more question. Anybody? Yeah. <coughs> Hi, Father. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'm interested in empowering. Uh, you as a practicing priest, how are you empowering your your clients or these populations that are born into these systems of oppression? Um, I, at the individual level, maybe at the macro level, um, <coughs> especially, you know, given everything that was discussed and the, the societal norm of India, 
and where does suicide fit into the um, idea of um, Catholicism and um, also other religious uh, institutions of India? Um, see, uh, so, uh, I'm working for the Catholic Bishops Conference of India, Office for Dalits and Backward Classes. Even this, uh, before this office was uh, started, people themselves start emerging to oppose this caste system. And uh, besides the NGOs I mentioned, there are also Dalit Christian movements. The people come together and assert their rights. Uh, they assert their rights um, of dignity because they want to cleanse the church. They don't want any untouchable practices that sh should be practiced within the church. And uh, to empower these people, there are two things needed. One is education and employment. And uh, this way only we can empower these people. Um, Dr. Ambedkar, who is the champion of the Dalits, promotes uh, three slogans. That is, educate, agitate, and unite. Uh, educate. Educate them the, about their rights. It is not, he talk, doesn't talk about the formal education. Rather, educate them about their rights. Unite. Bring them together so that they can ask their rights. And um, agitate. Agitate means not pro just a protest. Whatever the laws given against your human dignity, you violate that laws. For example, you are not allowed to take water from the common well, common pond. You violate that rule and go and take water. You are not allowed to enter a temple. Enter, your, enter the temple because you have got right. So this is the agitation he mentions. So people have to be educated of their rights. And this education now can be given by training programs as well as the formal education. Because the Dalits, they are not uh, allowed to learn. The fourth, even the fourth class in the caste system, called the Sudras, the service class, by the Manu law, they are not allowed to learn. If they, in the earlier days, there was no, there were no books, they hear through the oral education. So they say there is a law, if a Sudra hears a teaching, a lead has to be boiled and poured into his ears. So that is the law. So if it is the case with the Sudras, the fourth class, what is with the Dalits, the untouchables. So they, are, they were not allowed to learn for centuries. Now, it is only through education we can empower them. So education is uh, very important and education for rights, for their rights, that, that's very important. And this we are able to do, the, as I said, uh, the churches, the church of different denominations uh, were able to do because uh, they educate the people in places, especially the primary education they were able to give if now, now some people are in different places because of the missionaries, for the Ben and I am here, because the missionaries started school in the villages to educate us. That opportunity to get, uh, gave us to come up to this level. I am able to come here and talk to you because of the education given by the missionary. So the education is the first one. Through education we employ them, we empower them to ask for their, for their rights. Before I ask you to join me in thanking Father Raj uh, one more time, I do want to just um, point out that we have some uh, other events coming up uh, in April. Um, if you take one of these sheets with you, in particular World Catholicism Week in April, uh, which is about um, ecology in the church, we have the general of the Franciscan order who has been working with Pope Francis on the encyclical on the uh, environment, which will come out uh, sometime this year, uh, and a very exciting program. So uh, please join us for that uh, as well. But now um, I just want to ask you to uh, join me in thanking Father Raj. He's come a long way and given us a very powerful uh, message tonight. So please um, uh, join me in thanking Father Raj. Thank you.